This is a young woman of 22, but she knew her own mind and she had a strong influence over other people. She went to the, the Jacobite side and raised the clan chat and 300 men. She was able to motivate these men and their families to follow her, which is absolutely amazing feat. Jacobite supporters longed for a restoration of a Stuart monarch on the British throne. Previous attempts by James Edward Stuart had failed. The last hope after his death was his son, Charles Edward Stuart, also known as Bonnie Prince Charlie by his loyal supporters. Lady Anne Mackintosh, born in 1723 into a long-standing Highland clan in support of a Stuart restoration. Families like Lady Anne's had a history of being involved in previous Jacobite uprisings, so it was not surprising that a loyal daughter would follow in their footsteps. There must have been a lot of problems in families because there were people who were very sympathetic to the Jacobites and people who wanted nothing to do with them. And there were areas of Scotland, that were, as we know, that were very strongly pro-Jacobites, like the Highlands. And there were areas like Glasgow, which were more in favour of the government and the Hanoverian forces. Unlike Lady Anne, her husband Angus Mackintosh joined the Hanoverian government forces in direct opposition to his wife. However, it was not uncommon for families to divide their loyalties. A lot of us wonder if Anne and Aeneas were hedging their bets because that did happen in some families, that one son went to the Jacobites and one son went to the government side because the consequences of failure were at, at worst um, execution, death, burning of houses. And Aeneas or Angus Mackintosh was captain in the Black Watch. There was all these militia in the Highlands which were government controlled and government organised because that was the way they could find out what was going on in the Highlands. Bonnie Prince Charlie, the exiled prince, sailed from France to Scotland in the summer of 1745 in order to gather supporters for the Jacobite cause and dispose of the British King, George III. Loyal Jacobite supporters had been eagerly awaiting the prince's arrival, especially among the noble Highland clans. When Charles Edward Stuart arrived in Scotland, it, it became a matter of life and death for people like the Mackintoshes and Clan Chatton, which was a big, still is a big uh, confederation of clans. For true Jacobite supporters, for true Stuart supporters, there would have been genuine excitement I think the idea that this prince their true prince that they will have never met before was here in the flesh they would only have known him through pictures through accounts through um, miniature portraits and medals that were shared by the Stuart court passed out to their supporters history would lead most to believe that women did not play a significant role in the Jacobite uprising However, there is evidence and stories that tell a very different tale. Possibly most people thought women should just stay at home and stir the porridge. But the Jacobites were very gallant. They always held balls wherever they went. And there's, there's a lovely phrase which is, we will hold a fine ball for the ladies. But some people, especially on the other side, couldn't really understand that women were so involved in the Jacobite uh, cause and had Jacobite sympathies because women were supposed to just do what the role that, that people thought the world had intended for them. The men couldn't fight if they didn't have somebody that was ready when they came back with their food to repair their clothes, their boots and, and that sort of thing, to give them comfort even if they've been injured, you know, sort of the, the, the women would be the ones working with, with surgeons to actually um, make their men better. So the whole aspect of the war depended on 
good support and the women were the, was that support. The experiences for different women of different social statuses were definitely different and we need to consider that when we're looking at individuals like Lady Colonel Anne. There was such a, a class division then and the establishment were really worried when women of a higher social class got involved because women of that higher social class had influence. I think Lady Anne was treated differently because of her status in society. This idea that she was an elite woman, you had to be polite to her. There's a certain relationship that was acceptable. You still had to respect her because of her status. When Bonnie Prince Charlie raised his standard, Lady Anne dressed as a man and gathered 300 fighting men on her husband's estate and led them to the Jacobite army that was marching south. She was able to motivate these men and their families to follow her, which is absolutely amazing for you to actually step forward and take command, if you like, of a regiment. And those men willingly follow her and march to a war with uncertainty and, you know, not knowing what was going on, whether they would have homes when they came back. You know, she may have used a bit of threat, a little bit of poking with a sharp stick for you to follow them. But even so, for, for that to happen and for her to be accepted by the other, if you like, captains and generals when she met up with the, the main body of the, the, the army is an amazing feat for anyone. In February 1746, Lady Anne was giving hospitality to Bonnie Prince Charlie at Moy Hall, where she assisted in what would be known as the Rout of Moy. Hanoverian army or a section of the Hanoverian army was actually also stationed close by and they got wind that Charles Edward Stuart was staying at Moy Hall so one night they planned to come and invade the house. One of the soldiers in the camp managed to get a message to somebody else, one of the local boys I think it was, and basically at Moy Hall they heard that this was happening, that this um, detachment of the army was coming their way. So Lady Anne woke the house, although she let um, Charles Edward Stuart and his advisor sleep a little bit longer, and she went to the local blacksmith and they came up with a plan that would scare off the, this um, section of the army that was coming. So they sort of made like a bit of a mound that they would hide behind and gather together four men, I think it was, and they started to like shoot off guns and pistols and shout and make cries of all the different clans to make it seem like there was a whole army waiting for them. And that scared off the Hanoverians. And in the meantime, Charles Edward Stewart and his advisors had been woken and they managed to escape. Lady Anne's husband, Angus Mackintosh, was captured after the Jacobite victory at the Battle of Preston Pans and was taken into his wife's custody. Tradition has it that Lady Anne greeted her husband with a polite, your servant, Captain. He is alleged to have replied, your servant, Colonel, acknowledging the nickname which her raising of the clan had earned her. In April 1746, the final confrontation between the Jacobite and Hanoverian forces came to a head at the Battle of Culloden, where the Jacobites were defeated in the final battle to be fought on British soil. Colonel Anne was arrested shortly thereafter. The, you know, the government forces charged through the highlands, sort of killing anything with two legs, basically, and, and they felt quite justified to do it. The reprisals against the Highlands were truly awful and being a member of the gentry didn't really come into it. Um, I suppose Anne McIntosh was not quite as badly treated because when she, they came to arrest her, the, there were two men there who knew her of old. So they were gentlemanly. Um, she was hit by one soldier and another soldier said, do that again and it'll be you that will suffer. After the Battle of Culloden, the Bonnie Prince fled Scotland and returned to France, while his supporters suffered the consequences of their loyalty to the Stuart monarchs, though still hoping that he would return again. Colonel Anne was released into her husband's custody, a mirror of what transpired during the conflict, six weeks after her arrest.
Up until the 1750s, there was murmurings of another potential uprising. Um, they would still have been in communication with the Stuart court in exile. But for Lady Anne in particular, as, a, as an individual, um, I think she got off with it quite lightly. She didn't spend any extended time in prison. Um, she managed to really live out her life pretty much as it had been before. And because her, the estates weren't fortified, so they weren't forced to give up their land because her husband had been loyal, um, she would have also been able to continue her lifestyle as it had been. And there's this really fun story um, that later on in her life, Lady Anne was in London at a ball and there she met Duke of Cumberland and he offered to dance with her and they were going to dance a Hanoverian tune and she said okay well as long as we dance a Highland tune after that, a Jacobite tune after that.